inside and out. Um, I'm going to try and cover some of the internals of GORM during this talk so that uh, users who maybe only generally see the surface user facing area of GORM have a more be a better understanding of how the thing works. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is uh, uh, Graham Roche. I am um, uh, the Grails project lead at uh, OCI. Um, and uh, the uh, agenda for today is we'll go through a little uh, intro um, to GORM for, I mean, I assume all the ha everybody has used GORM in this room, or yes, more or less. So, um, and uh, a bit of a history, uh, we'll go through, a, I'll do a source code tour of, of GORM itself, and then we'll talk about the future and, and where we're going from there. So um, GORM is uh, the uh, persistence layer used by Grails. Um, uh, in the beginning, it was very much tied into the framework, but nowadays it's very much usable outside of Grails as well. Um, it's essentially an object mapping library uh, with support for multiple backend uh, data stores. So we have support for SQL via Hibernate, uh, MongoDB, uh, Neo4j, Cassandra and more. The, we ha it now has a fancy website. Uh, if you go to gorm.grails.org in the subdomain, um, you will. Oh, I need to mirror my displays here. There we go. Okay, so if you go to in a browser gorm.grails.org, you will see this is the website for GORM, and it provides you with uh, pointers uh, up at the top to the, uh, to the different implementations and their documentation. So you've got uh, Hibernate, MongoDB, Neo4j, Cassandra. There's a, even a Redis implementation. Uh, a developer guide if you want to uh, write your own implementation maybe for your own backend um, REST service or, you know, you want to go wild, then give it a, give it a go. Uh, so that, that provides a lot of useful detail, um, and I recommend you check it out. Uh, in terms of a history of GORM, um, so in terms of GORM 1, it was re really about procedural metaprogramming enhancement. So we did something like this. We had a class that, that, that did something like this. Uh, it would go through all of your domain classes in your Grails application, and through metaprogramming, it would add dynamic me methods to the meta class. Yeah? So this was you know, y years ago, back in Grails 1.x days. Um, this, is, this is how it was done uh, in GORM. Uh, it had a number of problems, though. Um, Metaprogramming presented a number of, of challenges. It was uh, slower to start up. The, the more domain classes you had, you can imagine uh, that for loop uh, becoming slower and slower over time as your application grew bigger and bigger. Um, and uh, it was harder to debug. So if you as a user uh, wanted to step into the save method to see what was happening, uh, you had to step through layers of dynamic metaprogramming stuff in Groovy. Um, which is uh, could have been a, was a little bit confusing at times. Um, it was harder to document as well. There wasn't any uh, way to really any formal way to document those dynamic methods like you have with Groovy Doc or Java Doc or anything like that. It was uh, we had to write our own separate reference documentation. Uh, so these were the the challenges, as well as it being harder to bootstrap because you had to put all of this uh, this logic in a place that was run at startup. So it made it very challenging to uh, support GORM outside of uh, Grails. Uh, so that's why in the early days there wasn't really a version uh, outside. Then came GORM 2, uh, which I think was uh, introduced in the uh, two, uh, Grails 2.0 timeframe. Um, and uh, we had some procedural metaprogramming enhancement. Uh, and the rest, but most of it was done by AST transformations, and we had our own uh, 
AST transformations that essentially went through your classes and uh, for every domain class node we would add a method node for the save method for example uh, to all your classes and um, they would typically delegate to another class. Um, so that was, uh, that was kind of the next evolution of GORM and that's uh, solved a lot of the uh, perf um, performance problems when it came to uh, better startup time because we could do it all at compilation time so there was no need for that iterative for loop at on, on startup to meta programming everything in and um, and if you did any kind of uh, you know removing of your meta class at runtime um, uh, you, you your methods wouldn't go missing uh, they would still they would be in the bytecode of the Java class um, so this was this was an improvement um, however uh, it was still a little bit hard to uh, debug because you couldn't, as a user, really step into the save method uh, because it was something that was added by AST transforms. So there was no direct source code. You could step into the delegating implementation, but it was a little bit more challenging. Um, so uh, then we went on to the next evolution of GORM, GORM 3, I guess, uh, further down in the... Um, in the um, 2.x and uh, th run about the Grail 3 line, uh, 3.0. And it was pretty much bye-bye runtime metaprogramming for 95% uh, of the cases. Um, and uh, it was only at AST transformations. Um, so incremental improvements, uh, again, at modifying your classes through AST transforms. Um, so as I said, uh, GORM 2 and 3 was a significantly step forward for the framework. Um, AST transformations were faster, they were more performant, not just for starting up your application, but also we could, we could make those methods uh, dispatch statically. Um, but they were still hard to debug uh, relative to uh, a normal API, and uh, still hard to document, yeah, because you there's still no way for us to, to to say to document the save method in any form. Would it have to be a separate um, uh, maintained reference documentation? So now, uh, with Grails 3.1 and Grails 3, um, it, with the 3.x line, we introduced um, GORM 5, which is a complete rearchitecting of GORM uh, to use. Uh, only a few AST transformations, uh, mainly around work queries and, and specific use cases, but the majority of uh, what is done by GORM now is done by traits. Um, so for ex the example, there is a GORM entity trait, uh, which all of your domain classes implement. Yeah? Uh, so what, what does this give us? This gives us the ability to um, uh, easily debug, because when you call the save method, you can step into uh, the actual implementation uh, as defined in the trait from your source code. It's easier to document because we can just use GroovyDoc or JavaDoc to document our traits. So when you want to see the documentation for the save method, you can, you can use you know, your normal IntelliJ uh, preview for the documentation on the save method, or you can step into the source and see the documentation directly above the method. Uh, rather than having to go to a separate uh, reference documentation. Um, it's fast, uh, so they're, they're all compi uh, compile static compatible, so if you, um, you can write lo logic that has compile static uh, on it in a service and invoke GORM methods now because they are actually defined in interfaces formally rather than being something added uh, by transforms. So, um, so in terms of what else we delivered in GORM 5, um, we had support for Hibernate 3, 4, and 5. Uh, as I said, it was completely written, rewritten and based on tra traits. And GORM 5 also was uh, um, uh, one of the few cases where we actually simultaneously release uh, plugins for both Grails 2 and Grails 3, um, as well as Spring Boot and standalone usage. So every time we do a release of GORM, we provide uh, ways for you to use GORM in all those scenarios. Um, also, as part of GORM 5, uh, we rewrote the MongoDB implementation to use um, 
codecs uh, in, in, as part of the driver. So in previous user versions of MongoDB, uh, Gorm for MongoDB, what we, what we would do is when you, when you, when, when you, when Gorm retrieved a document from the MongoDB database, it would convert that document into an object, yeah? And vice versa, you, before saving it to the database, we'd convert the object to a document, and the document would get saved to the database. With uh, GOM for MongoDB 5, we actually deserialize the object directly from a JSON stream via the driver. So there's no intermediary document object when you're both saving and persisting uh, your, your objects. So it's much faster and much less, um, uh, much less memory consumption. Um, so a, a big deal for MongoDB. Um, and, uh, and now, you know, going for MongoDB in our comparisons and in, in our benchmarks is as pretty much as close as possible to the native uh, MongoDB driver um, in terms of read performance. Uh, so a huge, huge win for GORM, GORM for MongoDB. Uh, we also worked together with a client of ours at OCI to, um, to develop for their uh, application uh, comprehensive support for Neo4j. So uh, Neo4j is uh, a graph database um, and uh, well, we rewrote it to support Neo4j 2.3.x with uh, robust support for Cypher, which is the query language for Neo4j and support for running it in both embedded REST and HA modes. And again, we released GORM for Neo4j for both Grails, 2, Grails 3 and Spring Boot. Um, so comprehensive support for Neo4j there. Um, by the way, who, who, uh, who uses MongoDB, GORM for MongoDB in the audience? Yeah, Quite a few hands. Anybody uh, using GORM for Neo4j? Far less hands. That's always what I see <laughs> in the audience. But uh, we're hoping that's going to improve now that we have better support uh, for Neo4j and GORM. So in terms of the, the source code, uh, if you want to play with GORM and, and the source, the source uh, location is, the repository is uh, the Grails data mapping repository. And you, you just, it's got a build.gradle file. You just open that build.gradle file in IntelliJ 16 and you, bu you build it with Gradle. You can type Gradle install to install the latest snapshot into your local uh, repository, and you can start hacking on GORM if you want. But now I'm going to start with the GORM source code tour, OK? So we're going to go through the source code, and I'm going to explain to you the different parts of GORM, what they're for, um, how, how they apply to your applications, and how you can potentially use them to fulfill use cases uh, in your, your application. Okay, so uh, over here I have um, an IntelliJ IDEA window here. Um, and there are different, uh, this is the source code for GORM, and there are different uh, sub-projects. It's a multi-project build, as you can see. And you can see on the side here that we, ha we have different sub-projects for each key part of GORM. Um, so the most, the, the, the most, um, the fundamental uh, part of GORM is Grails Data Store Core. Uh, Grails Data Store Core uh, provides all of the base APIs that all of the different GORM implementations um, utilize. Uh, so if we open that up in that source, you'll see that there's, there are various packages of notes in here that form GORM and make up um, the ability to use GORM. So uh, the core package uh, has got uh, various interfaces and classes for interfacing with what is the current backend back data store. So for example, there is a data store interface. Uh, the data store interface <coughs> is an abstraction around what, what your backend data store actually is. So is the data store interface a Mongo data store? Or is it a Hibernate data store? Or is it a Neo4j data store? Yeah? So if we open this class up, for example, um, and if you see the class hierarchy here, you can see that we have a variety of different implementations for different uh, backend data stores. So you've got a Cassandra data store, 
you've got a Hibernate data store. There's actually a variety of different Hibernate data stores because we support simultaneously Hibernate 3, Hibernate 4, and Hibernate 5, which each version has breaking API um, compatibility problems. We have to maintain, maintain uh, multiple implementations for each uh, version of Hibernate. Uh, so you can see all the different implementations there. Uh, the next key interface to, to familiar, familiarize yourself with is the notion of a session. So obviously, GORM has its roots in Hibernate. Uh, so in order to maintain semantics across all of the different implementations, uh, we uh, have this notion of a session just like a Hibernate session. But again, uh, there are different backend implementations here where you can see um, we have, for example, uh, implementations for Cassandra, for MongoDB, and so forth. So these are the key APIs. Data, data store you can think like of as, as kind of like a data source in SQL. Uh, session you can think of as like a connection and uh, you, you interface with, between those in order to create uh, connections to the backend data store. Um, so those are the kind of core uh, classes um, that make up um, data sources and connections. Uh, another interesting package here is the model. And this is what I'm gonna actually do, uh, start doing some uh, hack uh, hacking in a, in a window and we can, I'll demonstrate some stuff to you. With. So the, the model, is uh, what your mapping makes up in your application. So when we load up, your when we load up a, a GORM application, we need to know uh, what your domain classes are. Yeah? So what, what are all your domain classes? Uh, which ones are um, associated to each other? How they are associated to each other? So is it a one-to-many association? Is it an embedded association? Is it a one-to-one uh, one association, either a has-one or a many-to-one? Um, so in order to build up that model, we have an API for um, constructing that. And this is actually a very uh, useful API to familiarize yourself with because um, if you want to build applications that analyze your model, this is a good API to do that. I know a lot of people have traditionally used uh, the Grails domain class interface in Grails, but this is a far more complete and better in, uh, interface to, um, to use and also will not tie you to Grails itself. You can use this interface wherever you use GORM. So if you're using GORM outside of Grails, you can code to this interface. Um, so as an example here, yeah, I have set up a little standalone project um, where we can do some experiments so one of the key classes in this um, interfaces in this uh, in the model is the notion of a mapping context. So a mapping context is essentially uh, your domain model, right? Uh, and you can build one of these. Um, we have some default implementations out of the box. For example, the easiest one to get, get up and running with is the key value mapping, mapping context, which is used for, for example, uh, any key value database. Um, there is a Hibernate mapping context, but it's a little, a little bit more complex, complex to populate because you have to add Hibernate dependencies. So uh, for the moment, I'm just gonna show you how you can get up and running. And what you can do is, uh, in, uh, in your applications, uh, so in a Grails application, there's a, a mapping context spring bean. Yeah, so you can inject this type into your controllers, into your services if you want to inspect your model. And, um, but you can also build your own model uh, uh, out of a set of domain classes. For example, I can add a set, uh, bunch of persistent entities here. Um, so I, I can create an entity called person. And I can add it to my mapping context. And then, um, or we just use add persistent entity. And what that will give back to me is a persistent uh, entity instance. Persistent. Yeah, so I get back a persistent entity instance. And using this entity, we can find out various details about it. For example, what are, what are the persistent properties? So 
So we can print out all of those. So if I run that, uh, we'll see that um, the output is we can see the persistent properties that get printed there. The first name, last name, and version. So it's, it's analyzed my domain class and figured out which ones exactly properties are persistent. Um, if you have uh, has many, for example, and you, you run this again, you'll see that we now have children appearing there. Now the interesting thing is this persistent property API, uh, if we look at the um, sub subclasses of this, you can see that each persistent property can be um, of various child types. For example, it could be a many-to-many, -many, it could be a many-to-one, it could be a one-to-many, it could be a one-to-one. -one. So um, that way you can start analyzing your model. So you can say for if prop uh, instance of too many um, has a too many association. You can start analyzing your domain model and figuring out uh, what the structure of your application is from the mapping context, yeah? So this is useful uh, in a lot of circumstances. Uh, if you wanna generate UIs or generate uh, any, from, from your domain model or um, yeah, yeah, there's a whole. Bo if you want to write some kind of dynamic uh, conversion utility from your domain classes to, I don't know, JSON like we do in Rails, you can you can analyze these APIs and automatically produce um, different outputs that suit your needs. Yeah, based on your domain model. So it's a good thing to familiarize yourself with the mapping context API. Um, it is. Uh, um, it is an extremely useful one to understand and work with. Uh, so, other core, so we discussed object mapping. Other interesting core APIs that are in here is uh, the core project also contains um, all of the logic for GORM dirty checking. So there's a dirty checking pack package. And you'll see there that we have a trait called dirty checkable. So remember I mentioned to you that GORM uh, five is all built on traits. So even dirty checking is, is implemented as a trait. Yeah. So most persistence engines, um, when, uh, when they want to do dirty checking, for example, Hibernate, in Hibernate, uh, they have to, within the session, maintain a parallel array of all the changes you've made to your model. Do you realize how inefficient that is? So every time, Every time they want to check that your object is dirty, that has, it has been modified, they have to, in Hibernate, it has to iterate over all of your persistent properties and do an, a, a comparison based on what's in the session, yeah? So in GORM, um, at least in the GORM implementations that we've uh, written ourselves, and in the future we plan to uh, write our own implementation for SQL due to some of those inefficiencies I've just discussed, um, for example, in GORM for MongoDB, uh, we don't need to do that because we have a dirty, this dirty te checkable trait. And it's a trait that's applied to all your domain classes so that we know exactly when you've called a setter on, your dom on one of your domain classes. When you call set uh, first name, we know that you've modified the first name. We know that you've modified it because the trait has detected that you've modified your domain class. We know exactly when any modifications are happening to your model and when they've been modified. Um, so we don't need to do perform all these additional uh, checks. And the interesting thing about the dirty checkable interface, switching back to my little example project here, is that um, we can, uh, you, can imp you can, if I just get, make this not an entity, so it's, now it's a pogo, just a normal pogo, you can say implements dirty checkable and um, now uh, my domain class is dirty checkable. So we can say new person, my, my, my normal pogo is dirty checkable. 
So I can send a new person, uh, Fred, uh, last name Flintstone, and then I can say uh, person, start tracking changes. Um, so now if I say person has changed, print line, uh, it, w it will print false. And now if I do set first name, Bob, uh, and I do print line again, you'll see that it'll know that, um, yeah, it should know. <laughs> Uh, yes, sorry, I need the dirty checkable uh, annotation. There you go. Okay, so so just through those through just through those two changes to my class, I, I've made a, just a normal Pogo dirty checkable and trackable. Yeah, so you could apply this to your applications. It doesn't have to be even even using GORM. You could add this, this, this library to your class path if you want to dirty check or check changes to your application. That could be something useful that you guys find for your applications. Okay, so I'm going to start getting through some of this stuff. Uh, so other stuff that you'll find in Grails Data Source Core is the query API. Um, so down here in the query package, you'll see there is an API for building queries. So we, we build queries for MongoDB, we build queries for Hibernate, we build queries for Cassandra, we build queries for Nero for J. Each implementation is specific to those. Um, and uh, the query object defines a complete um, API on how you, you build queries. And as, as again, if, you see, if we look at this hierarchy again, we can see that you've got a Hibernate query, you've got a Mongo query, you've got a Neo for J query. You can see how each specific implementation is capable of building a different kind of query. Um, okay. Uh, other stuff. Uh, so classes of interest, the mapping context, the persistent entity, the persistent property, all that model, that, that's something that you guys can use in your applications. Um, the query object and the general querying API is all in Grails Data Store Core. Um, and now I'm going to talk about Grails Data Store GORM. Okay, so that's the next a uh, major project internally to create a sub-project that is worth familiarizing yourself with. So it's Grails Data Score GORM, and I'm just going to expand that open so that we can see what, what is in here. So you can see in here that in this package we have uh, a number of um, uh, interesting uh, public API facing packages. So for example, the ent entity uh, annotation, that dirty checking annotation that I just demonstrated, um, those are all part of, uh, out there. And then if we look in the data store GORM package here, we can see uh, some of the core traits that make up um, GORM. For example, this one, GORM entity, uh, you can see here that uh, this, this trait is what makes a GORM object a GORM object. Yeah. So you can see it takes a generic arg argument, which is the type. And um, if, we, if I switch back to my window here, uh, you'll see that um, if I change my domain class here to instead be an entity that implements uh, GORM entity and I pass in person, uh, without, uh, without uh, IntelliJ knowing that this is a Grails object or any, uh, a Grails domain class or anything, we can see that I have now the ability to um, uh, call GORM methods. Yeah, those methods, save, delete, and so on, um, are injected via that GORM entity trait. Yeah, so that makes it extremely easy to navigate into the implementation and find out how the save method is implemented. Or, or if I'm calling a static method, uh, like the list method, it's very easy to uh, navigate in there and see how the method is implemented by the GORM entity trait. Yeah? Uh, we can, of course, uh, <coughs> bootstrap this whole uh, example here using an initializer. For example, I can I use the Hibernate data store initializer. 
pass in my person class and then type uh, initializer.configure and um, then uh, we need to make sure that we uh, use a session <laughs> and uh, we can save that and give it a go and see if it runs. Uh, probably we need to print line this or something so we get an idea. But uh, yeah, that's how you can bootstrap GORM in the inside. You see, I get, I, my person down there was saved. Oops, there it is. Person down there was saved. So that's how you can bootstrap GORM uh, with j this is just a standard uh, build the Gradle project, GORM standalone, and I pulled it. There's nothing to do with the Grails here. And I've just added a dependency to Grails Data Store GORM Hibernate 5 and added a couple of runtime dependencies. And it's, I'm able to create, all in within this Groovy script, create uh, GORM entities, use them directly uh, without even thinking about Grails. Yeah? So, uh, so yeah, uh, in terms of the GORM entity trait, uh, this GORM entity trait, uh, you can see from the trait itself as well that um, it implements a number of other traits. So it implements GORM validatable. Yeah? So the GORM val validatable tra trait provides validation errors and so forth. It implements that dirty checkable trait I, I talked about earlier. So that's how your GORM objects become dirty checkable. Um, it also implements some interfaces like the GORM entity API so that you can potentially cast your object. If you just got a reference to object, you don't want to cast it to a specific type, uh, but you know it's a GORM entity. You can ca cast it to this GORM entity API interface and call methods like save and insert and delete and so forth. Or you could cast it to the GORM entity trait as well. That, that works too. Um, so you, you, you don't have to dynamically invoke the save method if you want to use compile static. You, compi you just cast it to a relevant GORM type, for example. Okay, so how are we doing with time? Yeah, we're okay. Uh, so Grails Data Store GORM provides all the GORM traits. Um, the public user-facing API, I guess you would say. Um, uh, the events, another interesting part of it that GORM, Grails Data Store GORM provides is the dynamic finders. Um, so if we look, go back to our API here, you can see there's a finders package and if you ever want to find out how dynamic finders work, this is where you come to look. Uh, so you can see that there is a dynamic finder class. And uh, that class um, is subclassed by a number of different imp concrete implementations. And these is how, this is how dynamic finders, you know, like booked up find by title or all those dynamic finders are implemented. So if you want to step debug into this, this is, this is, this is where you would come to look. Um, you can see how the count by finder or the find by finder or the find all by finder, they're all implemented inside of this package. Yeah? Um, okay, so that's Grails data store GORM. Um, uh, so some classes of interest in, the, in Grails data store GORM, as I said, I re already referenced GORM entity. Uh, you'll might, you might have noticed that within GORM entity, there were method calls to current static, static API or current uh, instance API. Um, so if we go uh, back to my GORM entity uh, traits uh, and we look at the save method, you can see there that there the, the implementation of the save method is not within that body. Um, it's delegating to a current GORM instance API. So why do we do that? Uh, why don't we just have the body of the save method right there? The reason is, is because you might want to swap out the backing in implementation. So a GORM entity could be at one moment a Hibernate entity and then another moment a MongoDB entity. And you, you want to be able to swap out the current implementation to be something else. Or it could be uh, you have multiple data sources and you want the current implementation to um, talk to one data database and then you want to swap to another API that's talking to a completely different database. Yeah. So that's why it's not directly in, in there. Uh, but you can easily navigate into uh, the current static API implementation, and you can see this is the GORM instance API uh, that it, you can see it delegates down 
and to do save, and you can actually see the concrete implementation, uh, the default implementation. Uh, this is the default, it might be overridden by something else, um, of how the save method works in GORM. Yeah? So, some key uh, classes to familiarize, uh, familiarize, familiarize with is uh, GORM stati static API. Um, GORM static API is all the static methods. So, here you will find, uh, for example, the list method, uh, how exactly that's, that's implemented. Uh, you'll find uh, methods like with criteria, um, to, and you can see how, uh, how it works with uh, calling out to criteria or creating detached criteria using where queries. So this is how your where queries are built if you're using where queries. Um, and the GORM instance API is instance level methods. Yeah? So save, delete, um, uh, valid, uh, actually validate is in GORM validation API because uh, you might swap, want to swap that out as well. So the familiarize yourselves with the code base in terms of you got the GORM entity trait. The GORM entity trait defines the overall contract of the API, but then it delegates to either GORM static API, GORM instance API, or GORM validatable depending on the method. Yeah? Uh, that's, um, and the, the design choice there is so that the backing implementation is swappable. Okay? Uh, and then the dynamic finder class, as I said before, uh, that's how dynamic finders are implemented. Uh, worth checking out. Uh, might be uh, an interesting uh, exploration. And um, next project is th that is interesting, if you're ever thinking of contributing to GORM, is Grails Data Store GORM TCK. And this is the test compatibility kit. It's about uh, 350, maybe 400 uh, integration tests that run across all GORM implementations. Yeah? So this one you can add a test, and when our test suite is run, it'll be tested against Cassandra, it'll be tested against MongoDB, it'll be tested against um, Hibernate, uh, Neo4j, um, so that you can know for certain that if you're making a contribution to GORM, that it's going to work, uh, that contribution is going to work across all the different Im implementations. Yeah? Uh, so it's currently hundreds of tests, and our, our build for GORM uh, is a, runs on Travis. It's a matrix, uh, Travis matrix. I think by our last check, it takes one hour and 40 minutes, accumulated minutes to run. Uh, part, of that, part of that I blame Cassandra and eventual consistency. Um, <laughs> because you have to put a sleep 10 seconds between each Cassandra test to make sure that um, <laughs> the, the data is there before you query that it's valid. Um, but anyway, um, it's a comprehensive test suite that runs thousands of tests uh, across a whole variety of implementations. Um, okay. And then we get to the actual concrete implementations. So, Grails data store GORM hyphen and then something. So, these are the actual concrete implementations of GORM. So, if you want to find out um, how um, GORM uh, for MongoDB is implemented, you go to Mon uh, Grails data store GORM MongoDB. If you want to go and find out how Hibernate is implemented, as I said, there's Hibernate 3, 4, and 5 projects. There's also a Hibernate core project which has sh shared code that both use that is, is binary compatible. Uh, Neo4j contains GORM for Neo4j and Cassandra, uh, and finally we also have test, and that, that is an implementation of GORM on top of concurrent hash map, uh, which is the implementation that's used in unit testing and mocking and, and that kind of thing. So what's coming in, in, uh, in GORM uh, in the future? Um, on the down the line, we have got uh, GORM 6 uh, in the pipeline. So, uh, GORM 6 has got a number of uh, major new features coming. Uh, we, we've got a new uh, uh, implementation of GORM uh, call that we're calling RX GORM. It's a uh, GORM on top of RX Java, and it's completely non-blocking, reactive, um, asynchronous, and stateless. So there's no session. <coughs> um, uh, there will be, uh, in, in the first release of GORM 6, there's going to be two 
implementations out of the box, one for MongoDB and one uh, a REST client implementation. Uh, and then in the future, in GORM 7, we'll be releasing um, SQL implementations for RxGORM. Uh, we've got Neo4j 3 support coming uh, and the Bolt driver support. We have um, native uh, multi-tenancy support that will work across all the different implementations. So you'll be able to support mu uh, multi-tenant use case, um, whether you're using Hibernate, whether you're using MongoDB, um, or whether you're using uh, Neo4j. Uh, that's the goal there. Uh, and hopefully that will include integration with Spring Security so that you can easily tie the two together if you want uh, your uh, tenant resolver to be powered by Spring Security and so forth. So uh, that's the plan um, for GORM 6. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, Rx GORM. Uh, it's essentially uh, GORM for Rx Java. Um, and as I said, it's, react, it's reactive. Uh, we do have, uh, you may be aware that we have GORM async. So GORM async um, is, a, uh, is um, a way to isolate your GORM blocking operations onto a different thread. But it's not a non-blocking implementation of GORM, so we should get that confusion out of the way. Um, so this is not GORM async. Um, GORM async was you still your, you, you run your GORM operations on a different thread pool that you manage, but that, that thread pool still blocks, yeah, when it's being executed. Rx GORM, on the other hand, is a completely non-blocking re reactive implementation where there's no blocking whatsoever. Um, and um, uh, I'm going to do a demo of it. We'll see how, how that goes. Um, I'm actually going to get to do two demos of this because you guys will get to see um, in the keynote as well. Uh, okay, so I've got a, another little test application set up here, and um, uh, one of the things that, that you, um, I'm using MongoDB to demonstrate this, so I'm creating a, a class, and one of the goals for um, RxGORM as well was to make it easy to set up. So just like uh, before, I'm not u using this in a Grails, um, uh, application. I'm implementing the Rx Mongo entity trait uh, for the person class, um, and I'll uh, annotate it with that entity as well. For Mongo, we uh, you have to provide either a string or an object ID, so I'll be providing one of those. Uh, then uh, it's simply a matter of um, starting up a Rx Mongo data store client. Uh, and telling it the de name of the default database to talk to. Um, you can feed into this constructor various different arguments if you pass in your own Mongo, Mongo client, your connection string, all sorts of things. Uh, I'm just assuming the default local host and we'll, we'll see how that goes. And now, if we look at, um, if we try and create a new person, what we can do is pass in the details of that person see if I can zoom in a bit so you get to see what I'm doing here. Um, you'll notice that when I call save, what do I get back? I get an, an Rx observable. Yeah? So calling save doesn't actually execute anything when you, when you do it until, until you subscribe to the observable. So that means... Uh, you can instead write code like this, where instead I'm going to do subscribe to a person, and once the person is saved, saved a person, we're going to print out the ID and the person's first name. Now, um, if I were to run the script, you probably wouldn't you probably wouldn't get any output because the script would probably exit before, because this is non-blocking, it's running in a background thread. It would exit before the thread had time to uh, finish. So I'm going to put a sleep call here uh, to uh, make sure that we see some output. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and I'll tell you how uh, there's another way to, to achieve that. Um, there you go. You see it saved my uh, saved my person. Yeah. So we that was completely non-blocking. It's subscribed. You su we subscribe to the result, and we get the result back inside the closure, and um, and we print it out. Now, uh, if I instead of putting this sleep call, a another alternative is to um, is to do uh, is to call two blocking and uh, get the first result, and we can uh, print line that. Uh, but uh, that's kind of useful for testing, but it kind of defies the point of uh, using Rx Java if you're going to be calling the method. That's why they specifically named that method to blocking, right? Because it should be a big warning sign. I'm doing something wrong here. Um, so, uh, so that that is uh, is, and um, so one of the things to note here is that Rx GORM is completely stateless. I haven't bound a session. There's no session. Um, there, there's no. There's none of that. Um, what that means is we made some design decisions around the API. So one of the things you'll see is that, um, for example, if I uh, if I run um, <coughs> if I s uh, s switch to a different database, um, so you can say with with database, um, and change the database name to something else, you'll notice that within the body of the with database with database closure we delegate to another implementation. So within here, you can call list um, and get an R R Rx uh, re reservable back. Um, and this list, li list method delegates to, to the closure uh, so that within the context of this closure, you're talking to this database. Uh, in previous versions of GORM, what we would have done is swapped out the backing thread local to be something else, yeah? But that's not the case with RX GORM because it's stateless. There's no thread locals, yeah? So in this case, the, con contr the controller delegate is responsible. Um, so that means within this block, it's slightly different. I can't just do first person save. That won't work because that'll talk to the original database, right? Because it's not speaking to a thread local. So instead, I have to use some, um, I have to use uh, save all new person um, so that's one thing to keep in mind, that within the context, you have to use the delegate of the closure to, so that we maintain that state the whole time. Um, OK, so um, uh, in terms of queries, you can um, call, like for example, the list method. And one thing that's interesting about RxJava and, and streaming is that um, the list method, if we subscribe to it, um, will give us a list of uh, people back uh, like that, and we can print line those people. Um, uh, however, um, people. Uh, however, that's not ideal because in a in a in a reactive application where you may when you may have um, when you may have uh, back pressure. Actually, I, I think I'm getting an error. That's why it's not. Uh, I'm just going to drop my backing database here. Uh, so drop to blocking first. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, so I just dropped my database because I think I had some existing data messing up my my, my state. Um, so one thing that you realize in, in a reactive application where you might have back back pressure and large data sets. Um, getting a list of, of objects that are de deserialized into that list, that could be enormous, right? Um, that, that could be a, a millions of records. So you don't want to really want to deserialize the whole list, but you might want to iterate, you might want to um, still pull in, you know, all of the data you have. So we differentiate the list method, which returns a list of people, to the find all method. Uh, and the find all method takes a person, yeah? And it will uh, reactively deserialize and send you each person as they become available. Yeah, avoiding loading the entire list of objects into memory 
and uh, running out of memory. Yeah, so you ha you have fully reactive queries uh, when using Rx Java and GORM. Uh, the other thing to to be aware is we've adapted the API. So for example, when you do a where query uh, like this, uh, what what you get back is a detached and a <coughs> detached detach criteria, but you see that it's in the grails.gorm.rx package. Um, so, and that means that this criteria has, li has myth methods, query methods on it, that return observables. Yeah? So, uh, that, that's critical as well. Um, uh, so, you can call find and then subscribe on that object uh, with your detached criteria queries as well. The same thing for, for dynamic finders. So dynamic finders will return an observable. Yeah? Criteria queries, the whole API has been adapted around uh, a reactive implementation. Okay, I think I have largely run out of uh, time for anything else uh, to discuss, but I'll be doing more demos of RxGorm in the keynote as well. So, um, if uh, you have any questions, now is the, uh, the moment uh, to, to um, raise those. Yeah, question at the back. Yeah, so um, the, if we go back to my test project here, where is it? This one. Uh, I'm calling the configure method, and that just sets up like a default in memory database, um, which you know, you're not going to use in a real application. Uh, but there's another alternative here called configure for, for data source, and that takes a single data source. Yeah? And then there's a thir uh, another variation called configure for data sources, and that takes a map of data sources where the keys are your. Um, are the alternative data source names. So if, if I had here a static map mapping block, and uh, this map to the data source uh, foo, uh, then I would provide a uh, foo uh, data source in here, and, and I'd have to build, you know, construct my data source object. So there would be some setup logic that you'd, I'd have my new data source, uh, my new SQL data source pointing to foo. Yeah? And you can provide as many data sources as you want and then map those in your domain model. Okay, does that explain? Yeah. So that's a good question. Uh, in, in GORM itself, uh, we have, uh, when you load objects from the database, yeah, we have special dirty check, uh, dirty checking support. We have special, um, spe a class here called di dirty checking support, and uh, if you call um, wrap on the collection, when you pass in the parent and the property, it'll wrap the collection in a uh, dirty checking aware collection that will mark the parent as dirty if it's modified. Um, so when you're using GORM, we do that for you automatically. So when you load an object from the database uh, with MongoDB, for example, we wrap those, uh, those results in dirty checking aware collection types um, and Neo4j and so forth and so forth. But if you are using that out dirty checking outside of, of, of GORM, then you would have to wrap your collection types uh, yourself, yeah, for that for that use case. Okay. Yes, yes, you can. Um, the you can subclass the dynamic finder uh, parent class. Uh, Typically, it, um, it takes a regular expression, so a regular expression that matches the method signature, um, and uh, 
you then have to register that dynamic finder with GORM. And uh, I can't remember how to do that. Uh, I think it's in GORM Enhancer somewhere. Um, yeah, you got, uh, it takes a list of dynamic finders and uh, re uh, when it's creating the static APIs, it registers those. So you would have to uh, add a custom GORM enhancer. It's possible, it's, it's, but it's a little bit uh, involved, yeah? Uh, question at the back? Yeah? Yeah, so <coughs> it's going to be similar but not tied to Hibernate. Um, so we'll still have the concept of, um, well, we'll, we're going to support the different, because there's different kinds of multi-tenancy. You've got single database, you've got multiple database, you've got, uh, so we, we want to support all the different variations of multi-tenancy, but without using, requiring you to use any kind of Hibernate-specific APIs. Yeah? Yeah, thank you.